you're able to stand, let's stand as we read uh, this uh, passage of Scripture. And um, as we read the Word of God, let's stand in uh, respect for the Word of God. So the Bible says here, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Father, I thank you for your word this morning and pray that, Lord, you'd help me to present the word of God to your people. Pray that, Lord, you bless each heart, encourage us. Pray that we might be filled with your spirit this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for the word of God and for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. I just want to put this. I forget sometimes to put my phone on silent and it just makes me so mad. Because there's always noises come on there. Just glad nobody rang me. <laughs> there we go. Just in case. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's have a look as well. Let's turn back in our Bible to chapter 13 of the same, of the same passage. So the disciples must have looked troubled at what Jesus had said. That's why Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. In chapter 13, verse 36 through 38, it says, Simon Peter said unto them, Lord, whither goest thou? And Jesus answered him, whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. And Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. And Jesus answered him, wilt thou lay down thy life, thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow, uh, not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. That must have been quite something to think about when the Lord Jesus told Peter, you're going to deny me. And so it's also interesting, we look at, uh, at um, chapter 13, how that um, Judas was the one who betrayed, betrayed Jesus, but nobody knew about it. They never suspected him at all. So he was, he was one of them. And they never suspected that in any way at all. But he was the one who betrayed them. Quite something to think about. So here we have the, 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 peop, the, the young uh, the apostles being really troubled about what Jesus had said. But then, of course, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. That's an amazing statement. That must have helped them to realize just how great our Savior is. Is your heart troubled? Many times we do. We do get troubled. And sometimes worse times, worse than other times. We're going to have a troubled heart sometimes. We, sometimes we are our own worst enemy. We really are. You know, we, we, there's a war going on inside of us. It's a war between this flesh and the spirit. I don't think I've got this verse up on the, on the um, screen, but let's just turn to Galatians. I don't think we have it up on the screen. Galatians, do we have that? I don't think so. Let's just turn to Galatians just briefly. I just want to read something for you here. And it says in Galatians 5.17, Galatians 5.17, it says, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So there's a war going on inside of each one of us. And we know that war. It's, we know it because we, when we're born again, we know that war is real. But before we're saved, we live for the flesh alone. The spirit is dead. The Bible says that we are all dead in trespasses and sins before we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's only through him that we're able to be spirit. Our spirit is made alive. And that's when that war begins. 
is a war within us and it continues all the time. It's, it's, it never lets up. That's why Jesus said, believe in me. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And our hearts shouldn't be troubled because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, what a wonderful message there is, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried again and he rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. People say, uh, might say, yeah, you're always saying that, always saying that verse. But it's a, that verse makes all the difference in the world. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and he rose again from the dead. That is the gospel. That is the good news that, uh, of, of which the Bible teaches. All we have to do is confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead and we'll be saved. I remember um, one time when I went out visiting, knocking on doors with um, Brother James Mansfield. He was the pastor of the church, of this church in 2011. And we went to this door and we shared the gospel with this uh, a fella and um, we asked him if he wanted to uh, uh, trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And then uh, James asked him, he says, um, do you believe that Jesus died for our sins? He said, yes, I believe that. And then James asked him, do you believe that Jesus was buried? And he says, yes. And he said, do you believe that Jesus rose again the third day? He said, no, I don't, I don't believe that. That's quite something. And of course, we tried to explain to him, but eventually we had to leave the door. He just couldn't accept that. Couldn't accept that the Lord Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. Yet we believe it. We, and, and it's essential. We have to believe that. That is the, the, the most important thing of the gospel is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And thou shalt be saved. It says that if you call upon the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. And we should believe in him because he's not only the son of God, but he is God the son. We shouldn't be troubled because firstly, number one, he's the creator. He created us. God created us out of the dust of the earth and breathed into Adam the breath of life. It's amazing that that breath that was breathed into Adam all those millennia ago is the same breath in us. We live because God breathed life into us into Adam and we still have that breath that's an amazing thought some have said that that uh, verse where it says it breathed into him the breath of life it's the breath of lives each one of us live because God wills that to be so he could take your breath away like that in a flash he could do it and he, and he has done it do you remember Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts where they lied to the Holy Spirit and they were standing there, and the next minute, whoosh, gone. Then his wife came in, and whoosh, gone. God's, our breath is, is in us because God put it there. Let's turn in our, our Bibles to Acts chapter 17, and just read this passage. I'm sure everybody's familiar with this passage. Acts chapter 17. I think I have it up on, we have it up on the screen, we should have. Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, we'll be looking from verse 22 through 26. And the Bible says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and behold your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he need, uh, needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life, breath, and all things. God lives, gives everyone life, breath, and that last one, all things. Well, that's something to the unknown God. They were worshipping a, a, somebody they didn't even know at all. Amazing thing to think about. Let's have a look at Daniel chapter 5, verse 23. Ezekiel 
book of Ezekiel and Daniel, dealing with this um, thought on breath. Daniel chapter 5 and verse 23. And the Bible says, But thou hast lifted up thy, thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou had, and thy lords and thy wives and concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast raised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God of those whose hand thy breath is. Hmm? Even this man, if you look further back on this situation here, it's when the hand was writing on the wall in Daniel. And then Belshazzar, the king, called Daniel to, uh, uh, to, to um, interpret the, uh, the, what was written on the wall. And uh, he should have known not to do what he did after he had seen his dad, Nebuchadnezzar, had already been humbled by God. Nebuchadnezzar was brought down for seven years and was in the field like an animal, eating grass. And um, then the Lord gave him back his kingdom. And his son should have known that not to do what he did, where he took the, the, the um, vessels from the temple, which were in the thing, and started drinking wine and using the vessels from the temple, God's temple. As a, and what a blasphemy to him, and a slap in the face to the, the Lord of the universe. So he told him here, he says, you should have known what you're doing. He says, yeah, a God in whose hand thy breath is, and it was quite in interesting that when after Daniel had told him about this, that it wasn't long after and, and uh, that same night that the king, Belshazzar, was killed. That same night. Quite an interesting statement. Quite an interesting thing. Turn back as well regarding this thing in bre with breath, that God is the creator. Let's turn to Job. Go back to Job. Job chapter 12, also dealing with uh, this idea of breath and how God gives all life. He's the creator, he created us. Job chapter 12, and we'll be looking at verse 10. And it says, In whose hand is the soul of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind. Quite, some, quite a statement that, isn't it? That everything, the, the, all living things and all breath is from God. You know, um, um, I love, uh, I, I just love creation. It is just life and creation is amazing. It is. You've got, if you really look, we don't look enough. <laughs> Unfortunately, we just don't really look hard enough at what God has made. Now, this planet teems with life. He created us, and he also created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. In John 1.3, it says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Nothing. He created the heaven and the earth, and, he, and everything that's in it, and he also holds all things together. Now, we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ here. He says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And it talks about him saying that in all, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything that was made that was made. Without the Lord Jesus Christ, nothing was made. He made it all. He created the heaven and the earth and everything that, that, uh, that's in it. And he also holds everything together. Some people say, well, they don't know how everything, why are the atoms and that, how, how things are held together. This Everything's held together by something, by, by some force. But it says that Jesus, in Colossians 1, 1, 16 and 17, it says, For by him were all things created. This is the Lord Jesus Christ we're talking about now. That are in heaven, that are in earth. Visible and invisible. Whether there be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. So that word consist means they hold together. It's by his power. 
That's an amazing statement. What an amazing thing that our God holds everything, the Lord Jesus Christ holds everything together. And think about everything that we use today comes from either the earth, from trees, from metal, from, from uh, plants. Um, the chair that you're sitting on comes from the earth or the ground or uh, more than likely all from the ground. Because the material that, that, that uh, a lot of these things are made out of are made from uh, fuel, are from underground, like oil. A lot of the synthetic ma uh, material that we have are made from oil. It's amazing. It's an absolutely amazing. And I think there was a thing that John said, or David said, uh, that about um, when God uh, came together with the atheist, and the atheist said, um, the scientist said, um, uh, I know how to create life. And uh, he says, um, okay, well, go ahead. And he says, well, first I take earth. He says, whoa, whoa, hold on a minute. Make your own earth. <laughs> God created everything, you know. Make your own earth. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. It is absolutely amazing. So um, you think about, uh, as well, insects. Um, some clothes are made from the, the, the cocoons of insects, silkworms. Um, everything is made from stuff that God has created. Without it, we would be able to do nothing, nothing at all. So Jesus created the heavens and the earth. He created the sea. Have you ever thought about the sea? The oceans, 71% of the, uh, of the earth is oceans and seas. So imagine everything that is in the sea, the life that's in there, that teems with life. It's just an in, uh, in, innumerable amount of, of creatures that are in the sea and, and all the living things that are in there. Do you know that they say that the earth, uh, the, 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 the oceans, all the water that are in the oceans would fit into a, a ball 860 miles in diameter. That's, that's a lot of water. I mean, 860 mile ball of water. And they say that um, fresh water uh, would make a ball 167 miles in diameter. But they say that potable water, water that we, we were able to drink, would, would be only be a 56 mile diameter ball of water. That's minute compared to the, to the earth. Really isn't that much fresh water around. But when you think about a ball 56 miles in diameter, that is quite big. <laughs> okay, so it's a vast amount of water that covers this earth and Jesus Christ created it all. Jesus also created the stars. Oh, don't get me started on that. It's amazing, isn't it? that the Lord Jesus Christ created the stars. It's amazing that in Genesis it says that God made the sun and then he made the moon. And just like an afterthought, he says, oh, and he made the stars also. You look out into heaven, look at the stars and see the vastness of space and how absolutely minute we really are. And where God says that the nations are, are nothing and less than nothing. I think we mentioned this before. How do you get something that's less than nothing? But with God, there's something that's less than nothing. <laughs> don't know how it is, but <laughs> he says that the nations are less than nothing. And yet he cares for us. The Lord Jesus Christ loved us and gave up his life for us. Us, the, see, when you look at the size of the universe, oh, nothing, absolutely nothing. So he created this Milky Way galaxy that we live in. Our galaxy is 100,000 light years in diameter. Absolutely enormous structure. A light year is uh, the distance that light travels in one year. And that is over 6 trillion miles in, in, in one year light travels. It's, it's, it's quite an incredible thing. It says that there also there are in the uh, um, Milky Way galaxy, there are about 200 to 400 billion stars. They say within 5,000 light years of, of our Earth, there are 600 million stars. You know, it's, it boggles the mind to think about these incredible things that our God 
uh, is able and, and has created. So they say there are in, uh, the, in our galaxy there are between two and four hundred billion stars. But they say they're also in the in the universe there are between two hundred and four hundred billion galaxies, and they all contain billions and billions of stars. It just goes on and on and. It's amazing. If you've seen the new photographs that they've taken of space with this new telescope that they built, and it seems with the, the, the bigger the telescope they build, the further and further things get away. There's just more and more they can see. What an incredible God. Just uh, boggles the mind to think about how great he is. So they say that in the universe there are billions and trillions of stars. How many names do you think you can think of in your mind now? You could probably count quite a few, probably about 20 or 30 or so names. But um, they say in England there are between uh, 72,000 um, names of boys and girls. That's a lot. I never thought there were that many. It's different names. That's quite a, quite a large amount. I wouldn't be able to think about how would we even think about counting or even saying those 70,000 names? Yet they say that there are 2,000 billion trillion stars in the universe. And you know what they say? The gods named every single one. <laughs> oh. I can only think of a few names, yet God has named 2,000 billion trillion stars. He knows the names of every single one. Oh... Uh, what a God we have. What an amazing God. What an amazing God. So why should we be troubled when we have so great a Savior as our God? And you know what? Jesus is, uh, is going to prepare a place for us. And David, David said in Psalm 23.6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, I've read some of the, um, uh, like the NIV and other Bibles, and you know what they say? They say that um, uh, Jesus is going to prepare a place for us. You know, says, there are many mansions. They say there are many rooms. <laughs> no. Nah. The Bible says mansions. I believe that. There's more than enough room in heaven. For each one of us to have a mansion but to think of uh, a room a room seems like a cell or something you know there's a room over there you know but the mansion when we think of a mansion in our mind we think of something really grand and 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 fantastic and god has prepared a place for us and he's going to come again to receive us unto our, uh, himself in the ma there's a mansion in heaven being prepared and it says in in uh, um, uh, revelation that this new Jerusalem, this new city that is being being made, was probably a, we can hope that it's finished by now, and it's all ready to come down. When the Lord Jesus comes down and He's going to shout and He's going to call us to be with Him, and we will be with Him in that city, in that city which is 1,500 miles square, 1,500 miles high, but made with all. Uh, jewels and, and the wall encrusted with all these fantastic uh, stones and gold so pure that it's like like uh, transparent glass and that's the, and it's true even in your mansion it'll probably be made of transparent glass we have nothing to hide and you have to be able to see all the way through everything because there's nothing to hide there's no sin there it's all gone. All of this, all this mundane system gone. And we'll be with him, our glorious Savior. It says there are 12 gates, each gate made of a single pearl, streets of gold so pure that it's transparent, a river of water of life coming out of God's throne and, the la and of the Lamb, trees of life either side of the river, bearing 12 manner of fruit each month. Only the best for God's children. Only the best. The best thing is, though, out of all of this, you know what that is? That Jesus is there. Amen. And that we'll be able to see his face 
What a glory. What a thing. Do you remember when... Um, let's just turn in with uh, to Book of Revelation briefly. I don't think I put that in on our thing. But let's just turn to the Book of Revelation, chapter 1, where it talks about the Lord Jesus Christ and how John saw the Lord. Revelation chapter 1. And it says here in chapter 1, verse 12, here's John, and he turns, he says, I, And I turned to see the voice of, that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were like white, like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Oh. <laughs> want to see that? I, I do. I want to see that. I'd love to see that, to see the, the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ and his and the wonders that he is and all of the saved will be in that city since the beginning of creation Adam Isaac Jacob Peter Paul all the other Christians they're going to be in that city and there's more than enough room for every person that's ever been born on this earth there are some things that won't be there though and that'll be sin there will no more, no more be there. When you think about the size of the city, just briefly, let's have a look at it. So this, if it's 1,500 miles square, that means just the area of one face of it would be 2.25 million, 2.25, uh, yeah, 2,250,000 square miles just on, on one side. So we can think that maybe it might be in layers, so let's say that um, each layer is 1,000 feet. That means there will be 7,900 layers. If you calculate that at the area of that city, if, there's, like, if it's in floors, just like we think it could be possible, that means it would be equal to 90 earth sizes, the area of the earth, 90 times the size of the area of the earth. There's enough room. There's enough room for everybody since the, since the beginning of creation. And that's what it was meant to be. It was meant to be so. That it would, should be able to hold every person that's ever been born. And it would be more than enough room and even room to spare after that. What an amazing place. And he's gone to prepare a place for us. And in Revelation 21, 1 through 8, it says... And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the earth, first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there were no, was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, come down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And it says here, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write thee, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh. He that overcometh. And some people might say, oh, it's not easy to overcome. How do I overcome? Overcoming is too hard. This world is difficult. I, I don't know how to overcome. Let's turn to 1 John 5. Four. Book of One John. First John. 
verse, John chapter 5, getting there. One John chapter five and four and five it says here, "For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world." And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Those are the ones who overcome the world, those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're the ones who will be overcome. And it says here, they that overcome shall inherit all things. Wow. You know, some people wait in their lives and inherit a house or inherit something, money. But we are going to inherit all things. All things. What an incredible thing that is. And I will be his God. And he shall be my son. But it says here. But the fearful. And the unbelieving. The abominable. And murderers and whoremongers. And sorcerers. And idolaters. And listen to this one. All liars. Have you ever told a lie? Yes, I have. We're all liars. But if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're forgiven. But if you're not forgiven, if you don't trust the Lord Jesus Christ and you haven't trusted in him, and you're a liar, it says here, they shall have their part in the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's an awful thing, thought. Interesting that it says... There'll be no more sea. In Micah 7, uh, 7, uh, chapter 7, verse 19, it says, He will turn again and he will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities and will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. That's why somebody mentioned that while well, there is no sea, because <laughs> that's where all the sins, <laughs> sins have been cast. But there will be no sea in the new heaven and new earth. doesn't mean there won't be any water. The Bible doesn't say there won't be any water but there won't be any seas also what well, won't be there no sorrow no crying no pain no death no curse no no night no night that means that's quite interesting it means you never sleep people so i think we're talking david and myself said, said oh, i like sleeping though <laughs> it is nice to have a kip isn't it there's no need in heaven there's no need to sleep we all, we all, we don't need rest we remember that uh, um, the life as we have it now is in the blood life is in the blood yet when we in heaven life will be in the spirit it'll be different and we'll have eternal life Thirdly, we have hope in Jesus. Jesus is coming again. Aren't you happy to hear about that? If you have a Bible, turn to Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. And I know all of us will be familiar with these uh, verses, but it's important. And it says, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Did you hear that? Others that have no hope. It's awful to think of having no hope. But there's hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this I say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them, which means, that word prevent means precede them which are asleep, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. The next event on God's prophetic calendar 
is the time, uh, his timetable is the, re the rapture of the church, the removal of the church. All believers are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And it says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. We will be with him forever. And that's the next thing that is going to happen. One day, we're going to hear a shout. Come up hither. That's what he said to John in Revelation chapter 4. He said, come up here. And John went up into heaven. And he, uh, that's where he received. And he uh, wrote the book of Revelation. But he was caught up. And after that, uh, chapter 3, in Revelation, the church is no more mentioned. Because it's in heaven. The church is in heaven already. There's nothing more powerful than God's word. When Jesus says, come up here, we will be gone. In a flash, the Bible says in the twinkling of an eye, an indivisible amount of time, it'll be flat, in a flash will be changed. The dead in Christ will rise and be caught up together and we'll meet the Lord in the air. Jesus is the only way. Yeah, folks, there's only one way to heaven. There aren't many ways, and it's taught all the time, there are many ways to heaven, but there's only one way. The Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is Jesus speaking. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In Philippians, the Bible says that God has given Jesus a name, uh, given him a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Things in, uh, in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm glad that I can say now, I can get on my knee and I can say, you are Lord. Because one day, the saved and the unsaved are going to say, yes, you are Lord. What a day that will be. Those who have rejected him, who have blasphemed him, used his name in vain, speaking awful things about the Lord Jesus Christ, saying that he's a myth. There is no uh, 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 crucifixion. It's all lies. I've heard it. People have said it. They don't trust in him. But one day, the day is coming, when they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and they will bow their knee to him. But then it will be too late. I wouldn't want to be in that situation. If you're saved and you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your, your saviour, think of before you were saved. Would you ever like to go back to that? Being dead in trespasses and sins, not knowing, not just having, I don't know, I can't imagine going back to that, but just if you, if you could, what an awful situation. But because we are saved and we've trusted him as saviour, it makes all the difference. And let me tell you as well, that once you're saved, you're always saved. You cannot lose your salvation. You cannot be lost again. You cannot crucify the Son of God afresh. We are crucified with Christ. Never li nevertheless, we live. That's what Paul said, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. We are raised together with him. In, in, uh, when Jesus Christ rose up from the dead, we rose up from the dead when we believe. We trust in him. So he is the only way. The Bible says in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no other way. No other name. You can think of any name you want, but there's only one name that saves. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the truth. God's word is truth. Jesus Christ is called the word of God. The word of God is true. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. John 1, 14, a says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It says, And we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
So the Bible tells us that Jesus is faithful and true in Revelation 22, 6. Then Jesus is life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He is the source of all life. John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath the everlasting life. I shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Now listen to these words in where the Lord Jesus Christ is talking here. And he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. I don't know if you remember, you know, the, um, when Lazarus was, uh, died, and then Jesus came to the, to the tomb, and then uh, said, and said open, the, open the tomb. And then um, they said, no, but he's been, he's been dead four days. He's going to stink by now. But Jesus said to him, Lazarus, come forth. It's quite an interesting. Some have said that had Jesus not called Lazarus out by name, everybody would have risen up from the dead. And that is how, he, how powerful he is. He chose Lazarus by name to come up. Quite, so, quite an interesting statement that isn't to think about. But all it says here, that the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Every, everyone who's ever lived are going to hear his voice. They're going to hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. John eleven twenty five says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me, in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Do you believe it? I believe it. I believe it. And so should everyone believe that. So let's not be troubled. Jesus saves. Are you saved? Are you 100% sure that if you died right now that you'd go to heaven? If you can't answer that question, you need to think about something. You need to realize that you're a sinner. And turn to the Lord Jesus Christ today. He's calling you today. The Bible says that there is none righteous. No, not one. There's none that doeth good. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Who's that man? Adam. Adam sinned. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And you know what the Bible says as well? The wages of sin is death. Eternal separation from God. I can't even think of anything worse. And, uh, you know, we can't get into situations sometimes and, and we think we're not ever going to be able to get out of it. But it, we do. And you know, we come through situations. But to think that in the lake of fire, when, when uh, eternal separation from God, there is, no, there is no escape. We need to be witnesses to, uh, to, the, to the unsaved. We need to be telling people, it's, people are in trouble. So the wages of sin is death. But it says here, but God commendeth or proved his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. If anybody's listening who doesn't know, on, on maybe out there, on, on the um, airwaves, <laughs> if they're not listening, please think about it. Think of what the Bible says. Think about uh, sin and what it's doing to your life, destroying your life. But there is a way of escape, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we long for the day that we will see uh, your face. And the Lord, uh, what a wonderful day that will be when we look upon your beauty and your wondrous, wondrous face.